Good morning, everybody. I guess it's morning here. It's starting to get almost afternoon in some places. We're so glad that you're here with us today. My name is Beth Farley, and I'm a partner out of our Reno, Nevada office. And later, Stacy will be joining us um, to go over some of the things, and she's out of our Sioux Falls office. Both of us work significantly in the nonprofit area, so we're excited to be able to talk through some of these common errors that we find in nonprofit financial statements. So our objectives today is to identify some of the most common errors we find, um, not all of them, but just the most common, and what those effect would have on the financial statements. And then maybe hopefully we can give you a few best practices to avoid some of those common errors. Our agenda today is we're gonna go over the statements that we see on the screen here. So financial position, activities, expenses by nature, and cash flows. And then we'll have a quick final review. Um, although we're only going through the financial statements today, I do wanna be uh, clear that we're gonna talk a little bit as we go through this, the importance of making sure the notes, the financial statements, you know, align with what we're seeing in the financial statements as well. We will have another webinar in next month that goes talks specifically on the notes, the financial statements. So hopefully you can tune into that one as well. All right, we're gonna jump right into the statement of financial position. The primary purpose of the statement of financial position is to talk to show your assets, liabilities, and net assets and their inner relations with each other at a moment in time. So at one date um, at the end of the fiscal year calendar year. There are five required elements that show, should show up on your statement of financial position. You should see a total asset line, total liabilities line, total net assets, and then the breakout between with and without donor restrictions. Anything else as far as subtotals or additional breakout would be left up to the organization to include those for better readability for the user of the financial statements, but these are required to have, so we wanna make sure we're seeing those. As we set up the statement of financial position, an important piece is going to be looking at the liquidity. And on the face of the financial statements, how we're seeing that is sequencing your assets according to the nearness of their conversion to cash. So how, how, how quickly those get converted and then sequencing your liabilities in the order of the maturity by the use of that cash as well. Um, sometimes you'll see the clar classifying assets and liabilities as current and non-current and making sure that those are, if you're doing that, that they're classified properly into the different sections. And then disclosing your financial statements, any relevant information about the liquidity or maturity of those assets and liabilities and making sure that those tie into the statement of financial position. So as you kind of go through and evaluate that and how you're ordering things, it's really important to understand all the accounts that are going in to create your financial statements and what the restrictions and liquidity would be on all of those items. A Couple of factors that will affect the liquidity are um, the three that you're seeing here. These are the top three that we usually see. Um, the first one is donor imposed restrictions. So if you have a donor imposed restricted endowment or maybe you've been donated some assets for the purchase of long lived assets, those would be maybe the liquidity would be different than just a general cash account. Board designations, uh, quasi endowments there, reserved for spe special purposes and then legal and contractual restrictions. Usually that's a retirement sinking fund for the retirement of debt, but there you might have some other contractual restrictions as well that you'd wanna detail out. So again, making sure you have a clear understanding of all the restrictions and designations as you put together that and you're splitting out different types of assets into those uh, different restricted items or contractually restricted items. All right, we're gonna take a quick look at a couple options. So this is, and we're just gonna look at assets, but you kind of can envision liabilities are very similar. We're gonna look at the um, sequencing of those. So here you're gonna see option one to show your assets and you'll see that total asset. So again, that was one of the five required items. Um, you're, you'll see here that you've got cash and cash equivalents at the very top, but then you see other cash for restricted for building projects that's lower down because there is some restriction to that. Um, so it's, 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 you wanna be clear in how you're breaking those out and having that liquidity shown that. So the sequencing of that is gonna be very important. The second option here is you can see the breakout between current assets and non-current assets. 
You notice these are the same dollar amounts that on the other one, but as you look between the two statements, this one's a little bit longer. And that's because you're gonna see like up at the top, you'll see the promises to give, and then you also see promises to give net of current portion down below. So you may see a couple items that are broken out between your current and non-current. So again, being really clear on what is current and what is non-current. So a common error you would see here is that something's not in the correct category and not being classified correctly. Both of these are good options that you can present and um, either one is acceptable. A couple of common errors that we see within the classification has to do with cash. I know I kind of mentioned that already. Uh, there is no specific definition of what constitute restricted funds. So net assets restricted for donors for operating activities typically are not shown as restricted since they're for use for general purposes. However, they're, if they're restricted for long-term purposes, such as the endowment or those that would be um, restricted for other reasons would be shown as that and you'd wanna have that separation. Other things that we would see that would be restricted typically are deposits that are held, maybe escrow a debt service like we talked about, split, split interest agreements if you have those, and any endowment. So as you're looking through that, um, again, there's no specific definitions, but you really wanna understand how your cash is being held so that you can break that out properly since that is a very common um, issue that we can find sometimes. Now we're gonna look at receivables. Problems that we see here are typically related to the timing of recognition of the valuation. Uh, we want to recognize promises to give when they're received, but we wanna make sure that they're actually a promise. Words that we sometimes see from donors will say, I plan to give, or I hope to give, or if your pledge card says that it's not legally enforceable, those are intentions and those should not be recognized until they're actually pledged. You would want to recognize only unconditional promises. Um, if it's a conditional promise, you have to make sure that you're meeting those conditions before you recognize those. Cost reimbursement grants are not specifically always um, mean that it's gonna be conditional. What's important when you're looking at conditional contribution is that the recipient has limited discretion over the manner in which the activity can be conducted. Limited discretion means that it's more specific than a donor imposed restriction. A restriction would be more um, specific about an activity or a time, but it wouldn't necessarily put limitations on how the activity is performed. Examples of an limited discretion, discretion would include requirements to follow specific guidelines, um, incurring how you qualify the expenses or a requirement to hire a specific person or any pro specific protocol that you have to adhere to that would be more of a condition than you would see as restricted. And so, of course, when you're looking at federal grants, that is, uh, would be a condition because you're following uniform guidance that is very specific to that. The other thing to look at with receivables is making sure that you're measuring it correctly. So when you receive a promise to give, you wanna measure it at the um, net realizable value if it's due within one year or the fair value if it's due within more than one year. So that's typically calculated at the present value of future cash flows. So really evaluating that measurement and making sure that you've done that discount cor correctly if required. In addition, um, you wanna assess the collectability of your promises to give. Do you have an allowance for doubtful account that you may need to take into consideration? All that kind of comes into you know, the presentation as well between uh, FASB 605 and 606. So 605 and 606, we're gonna talk a lot about between the financial position and also statement of activities. 605 is your non-exchange revenue, really talks about the conditional um, and restricted uh, revenues that you receive and 606 is exchange revenue. And there's different ways that you present those throughout the financial statements and notes. So making sure that you understand and this is something that I would recommend from the very beginning when you have a revenue stream, type of revenue that's coming in, you're gonna evaluate this. What standard does this fall under? And then you're gonna really make sure that you're documenting. Okay, if this falls under 605, do we have conditions? Do we have a right of return and barrier? That's gonna then flow through how you record it in the financial statements and the accounting system to go into the financial statements. If it's 606, you know, are you following that non that exchange transaction revenue recognition processes? A couple things on liabilities, won't spend a lot of time here, but 
one thing that we see sometimes is an error is debt issuance cost should be subtracted from the debt and not as a deferred charge as it was previously many years ago. Um, and then funds held for others are not properly segregated. We do see that quite a bit sometimes if you have an employee benefit pension plan, making sure that that presentation of the cash of any assets and liabilities related to that are properly split out. And then you've got deferred revenue and refundable advances. I would say that I see this um, used interchangeably and correctly quite a bit. Again, deferred revenue, this is, goes back to the 606, the non-exchange and the exchange revenue. So deferred revenue is gonna be your contractual obligations under exchange revenue and refundable advances would be uh, conditional guidance uh, for non-exchange transactions. So making sure that you've got those receivables, those deferred amounts and refundable advances categorized correctly. Let's jump into net assets. So what you see here on the top is the minimum presentation required on your statement of financial position. You have to show total net assets and you have to say, show with and without donor restrictions. I would say that a lot of nonprofits do end up presenting more information because they want it to be useful to the reader. Because that's a really important part as everything we talk about, you've got minimum requirements, but then what is use, useful for the reader? Um, when, you when you break it out more, as you see on that alternative there with undesignated and designated and the different types of restrictions, you're letting the user identify your availability of resources, identifying that you have endowments and what programs they support, and you're identifying purposes and what the resources can be spent for. Um, also, when we see really good detail, both on the statement of financial position and then the notes of the financial statements, it really tells a user that you understand the restrictions that you have, you understand the fiduciary responsibilities that you have as a nonprofit to uh, track all of these, report them, and making sure that you're spending it correctly. So it can be really good for the user to see that more detailed breakdown. Um, all right. Net assets for board designated. I want to be clear that these are, um, so these are self-imposed limits versus restricted from a donor. They can be for a variety of purposes, short term or long term. Um, that designation and how they're used, how they're appropriated can be delegated to management and you can disclose them on the face or in the notes, but they should be disclosed. What I want to bring up here is that the documentation of your net assets can be really crucial. You want to have a really good roll forward of your net assets that's very clear about what's restricted, what's board designated, and then the remaining piece that would be undesignated. Um, sometimes what I've seen is that the board has designated something, but it's not clear how, you, how it's supposed to be used in the future. It's not clear when that was designated or what, really what the full purpose was. It might just say, you know, operating reserves designation. But what does that mean? You know, what, why did you determine that dollar amount? So really having that do underlying documentation within your accounting system, within your processes to show why you have board designated, how, what additions and uses were during that year. And then also the same thing that you would have with donor restricted balances, making sure that all of that can flow through and you have that information ready to prepare your financial statements. A Couple other things I just wanna to briefly touch on for the statement of financial position is leases. As most people I'm sure have heard lots of webinars or lots of discussion about leases, they should be fully adopted now. It's for um, calendar year 22 or fiscal year 23 that just recently ended. So those should be all adopted. You wanna make sure you have separate lines for operating and financing use, right of use assets as well as the financing obligations. Those should not be combined together as assets and liabilities, there shouldn't be a net amount. So those should be all separated out. Every once in a while, we see an error where outstanding checks in excess of bank balance are shown as negative cash. Those need to be presented as a liability. Be very clear about related re party receivables and payables. Those shouldn't be netted. Those should be broken out and shown that way. And then if you do have capitalized interest, we don't see this. Um, we see it sometimes, but we want to make sure that if you do have capitalized or interest in a building project, that you're really kind of presenting those properly. Got a uh, polling question here. So um, just looking to see, you know, kind of what 
you guys is prepare as the financial statements, C is most your most difficult part in preparing those. Um, I would say probably receivables, deferred revenue, revenue recognition has con continues, even with a clarification, continues to be um, some difficult areas. And then I see a lot of net assets just making sure that it's clarified properly. Again, that the documentation, the roll forward properly is, is so important. Okay, everyone, we have our first polling question up. If you are here for CPE, please make sure you are answering these polling questions. You will make your selection right on the screen. And then after you make your selection, you will scroll down just a bit and hit submit. Make sure after you make your selections, you are hitting submit so the answer will count. And we'll keep this up for just a few more moments and then we will continue. And then, Beth, there is a question in the Q&A box. Okay, let's take a look. So what the question is, what are underwater endowments? An underwater endowment would be that the amount that you were given to be held in perpetuity has now gone under that dollar amount, meaning that you probably had some unrealized uh, losses that reduced it. So if you if you receive something that for $100,000, it's to be held in perpetuity, but now it's only sitting at 95,000, that's underwater. So you, would, you need to report that separately to show what that is. And it's because you know you never know what the market's going to do, and sometimes you'll see it underwater one year, and then it jumps back up the next year. Uh, monitoring that your endowments is very crucial to make sure that you're understanding your spending policy with potential realized gains and losses to to watch out for those. Alrighty, and we are ready for results. There you go. All right, leases, yes, leases are very difficult that first year. Hopefully, once you kind of get it all gathered and rolling forward, we'll um, be a little bit easier after that first year, but receivable net assets are right up there too. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and jump forward. We're gonna now dive into the statement of activities. With the statement of activities, there's a lot of flexibility within your presentation. There, you're required to present totals for net assets net assets with and without um, donor restrictions, the changes there. But there's not a lot of other very specific things that you're supposed to do as far as the format of it. So we're gonna talk through a couple of different options you have. You have a single step or a multi-step, which would be you know talking about your operating measure or not, um, if you want to do that. A single column or a multiple column, sometimes referred to as pancake or columnar. Um, and so I'll, those two, I'm gonna have a presentation on the next couple of slides so you can kind of see what those differences are. Comparative statements are recommended by FASB but are not required. And so that would be full comparative, meaning you're showing all your statements at both years, your notes also are full presentation. A summarized comparative information is allowed, but again, also not required. So you are allowed to do a summarized presentation. So let's go ahead and take a look at this multiple column format. So you can see here that you're gonna show your revenue and expenses and your change in net assets. You've got with and without donor restrictions and total. And then over here on the right-hand side, that's your summarized comparative information because it's not showing all of the changes with and without donor restrictions. So that's why it's summarized comparative. And what you'll see down here is you've got the change in net assets by with and without donor restrictions. You also see that beginning of your net assets as well as the end of your net assets in, in um, with and without donor restrictions. So you've got some detail there. So when we jump forward here to the single column, um, you're gonna see the same information presented in a single column. And we're gonna start off with the without donor restrictions. So this is also considered a full comparative because all the lines are presented for the prior year um, for both with and without donor restrictions. Again, so one of them is gonna be wider, one is longer, um, just depending on how you want that presented. And then when we jump forward to the second page, you're gonna see the change in the net assets with donor restrictions, your total change, but what you won't see is your net assets beginning of the year um, with and without donor restrictions. So that is a difference between the two. Um, there's positives and negatives, just depending on how you want that to be presented. Okay, let's go ahead and jump into some of the errors that we see. So some of the things you want to be aware of is incorrectly presenting your agency transactions within your statement of activities. Again, going back to understanding what an agency transaction is, getting that recorded in your accounting system so it can roll up properly. 
Certain types of revenue, such as due and dues and sponsorships, may need to be bifurcated. So if you have a due or a sponsorship for an event, for example, somebody purchases a table at a gala, and then a part of that is exchange, uh, exchange and part of that is a contribution, those need to be split out and evaluated separately for how they're recognized. And so that can I can see that happening quite a bit because it kind of all gets lumped into maybe special event income. Same thing with dues if part of it is contribution, being very clear on, on what is um, following the two different revenue re recognition areas are important. Sometimes we can see net assets relief from restrictions don't net to zero. You would normally see that in that single column format. Um, and I'll jump back real quick just to show up here, you've got that uh, release from restriction here. And then down here, you've got the same one down here. On the two columns, you can kind of see them go across and it nets to zero. That's really easy to see. But sometimes when they're separated like that, there can be an error in there, meaning that you have one of your contributions listed incorrectly, possibly. Um, so making sure that those ma um, match are important. And then missing maybe some required subtotals or totals for the change in net assets. So you've got to make sure you have those separated both out between with and without. Use of operating measure, I know I mentioned that there. Um, we do see this sometimes. This is not required to split out between operating measure, but if you are going to, I'm just kind of including this here so that you really consider what is operating and non-operating and why you're including those. An example would be like a defined benefit plan. The service cost would be operating the components of the net periodic pension cost, and those would be um, not included in operating. So you just want to evaluate that if you're using that operating met model. We always get a lot of questions about netting, you know, what can be netted and where. So investment expenses are required to be netted against investment return. Sometimes you'll see a breakout in your investment return presented separately for different types of investment return, operating versus endowment, for, ex for example, but that investment expense should be netted there. Gains and losses can be reported as a net amount if it's resulting from peripheral or incidental transactions. So what's peripheral and incidental? That's looking at the frequency of events, part of an unusual activity or strategy or significant of the gross revenues or expenses. So you wanna evaluate whether or not those gains and losses can be reported net together or if they need to be reported separately. So like a pledge with a loss to a pledge, those would be reported separately because those are frequent, usual, significant, um, but maybe the, the sale of a building or land that's no longer used would be peripheral. An important part too is special events. You know, you have a lot of different special events. How are we gonna report the expenses and the revenue to that? Netting special event expenses against the revenue is again only allowed if it's an incidental or peripheral activity, which is probably not um, as common. So let's look at what you would normally present. You're gonna have your gross revenue. It can subtract the direct cost to benefit to donors. That direct cost would be the exchange the donor is receiving for something in return. So not all of the expenses that go to that special event, but what they're actually getting directly in return for that. You would present special event gross revenues in the revenue section, and then costs of those directly would be reduced as that. And then you would also support them as uh, on your statement of functional expenses is too as well, and they get backed out there, which we'll look at that a little bit in a um, couple slides when Stacy's going over that. Um, you also want you could also have an option of presenting that contribution, as I talked about, that important piece of breaking out your contribution exchange portion of your net of your special events. You can report those as separate or combined, depending on how you would like to show that, but the direct benefit to donors can only be reducing the um, exchange portion of the gross revenue. And nothing else, again, is allowed to be netted against that other than the direct benefit to donors. I think we kind of say that a couple of different ways just because that something sometimes gets a little confusing. Okay, going back to contributions, and a lot of this ties back into the receivables that we already talked about. Um, conditional versus unconditional, really understanding the underlying accounting and how that rolls up into your financial statements, documenting your revenue streams to make sure you understand that. Um, contribution revenue for prop promises to give for future periods. There's uh, 
kind of an assumption that if you're receiving promises to give in future periods, it's supporting those future periods unless the donor specifically says, I'm going to give you this money now. I'm going to pledge this money now. It's all for this year. We're going to pay it later. Probably not as common. So there's that assumption that that is um, a restricted for future periods. You should have an, a policy for when you have contributions that are met in the same reporting period. So you receive a contribution, you meet the condition. You can either report that as um, donor with donor restrictions or without donor restrictions. So with donor restrictions, you'd see a release. Without donor restrictions, you would just see it in that column there. Um, you want to be consistent in how you apply that uh, within your organization, and then you want to make sure the disclosure is there, and then you're actually following that policy. Because sometimes we'll see where it's not consistently applied across all contributions, or the policy is written differently than how it's being presented in the statement of activities. Failure, so the next two, uh, last two bullets here are talking about gifts in kind, contributed non-financial assets. Uh, sometimes we see that people just don't, or organizations don't realize that they, what uh, non-cash items they do need to record and get that recorded properly. And then if it is material, they should be separately reported. Grants can be contribution or exchange. And so if a grant is determined to be an exchange transaction, those would be reported as without donor restriction. Um, and so again, errors that we see here, kind of similar to contributions, is that they usually relate to properly identifying the conditions within the grant and getting that properly reported. If you do have a split interest agreement, you wanna make sure that you're recording and documenting those properly. So contributions from split interest agreement should be reported on a separate line or disclosed in your financial statements. Any changes in that value of the split interest agreement, again, should be detailed out. Um, contribution revenues recognized from the split interest agreements are typically with donor restrictions unless there is one of the two exceptions there that the donor has given you immediate use of it or your laws and regulations um, allow you to do that. But normally those split interest agreements be with donor restrictions. Expenses and losses. So on the statement of activities, you can present a mixture of natural and functional expense classifications on the statement of activities, but then you also need to present that statement of functional expenses or disclose it, that's still required. Expenses are reported as only decreases in net assets without donor restrictions. You would never see expenses in that with donor restrictions. The way you're seeing that release of restrictions to reduce the restricted amounts would be with that uh, release from restrictions, so not the expense side of it. Losses may be reported as decreases with or without donor restrictions as applicable, so understanding your losses, where they're being driven from, and be getting those reported properly. And then losses from, example, from property and equipment don't belong in expenses. Those would be on your statement of activities. I'm going to just kind of put this out there real quick and not go into too, too much detail, but um, sometimes we see referring to a related party as an affiliate. So I've got the um, definition of an affiliate there. Um, you can see an error of recording transaction as with affiliates when it's really just doesn't have that control relationship. So if you have something, you know, ask the question, kind of take a look and see if that's being reported correctly. A couple other things that we see uh, to make sure that you're being aware of, if you have discontinued operations, unusual and frequent, if you have some agency transactions, change in your total net assets um, for non-controlling interest or collections on capitalized. So these are kind of just some overall things that probably not usual and you're seeing on your day-to-day -day transactions, but if you have something that's unusual, make sure you're taking a look. The other thing I'm gonna kind of throw in here too is that if you have an other revenue account, really understanding what goes into that, and especially if it becomes a material amount, we sometimes will see this very large other revenue amount. So you wanna make sure you're breaking that into smaller categories if needed so that it's not being lumped too much. A couple other common errors. I'll try to go through these quick. I wanna make sure Stacy has plenty of time for the other two statements as well. Um, inappropriate accounting for investment return, again, with or without donor restrictions. This all drives back, you know, to really understanding the donor's intents on your contributions and everything that goes through. Um, one thing, this middle 
a section here is really important is that you have to use uh, restricted dollars with donor restrictions prior to using unrestricted dollars. So you can't just squirrel away those you know, restricted net assets for future purposes. Uh, and properly releasing your donor restrictions that are subject to both time and purpose. So if they have both the time and purpose and they haven't met both of those, it's still restricted. A couple of things that are important with long-lived assets is making sure that once those assets are placed into service, you've released that. Again, on the flip side of it, if it's still construction in progress, that release has not happened yet. So you have to show that as still restricted as long as the construction in progress is still going ongoing and it hasn't been placed in service. Um, and again, just reporting revenues and exchange transactions as um, in net assets with donor restrictions that they should be exchanged should only be with out donor restrictions. All right, so that's a lot of information. <laughs> and now we're gonna jump into a couple other statements here. All right, thank you, Beth. And there are a few questions. We wanna just make sure we get through all the material first, and then we'll jump back in and address those questions. If for some reason we don't have time, we'll reach out um, separately after the presentation. So want, just don't want you to worry that your questions aren't getting answered, uh, we will get to those. Um, so statement of functional expenses. So this is a required presentation um, for all nonprofit organizations. It's kind of unique to nonprofit reporting where the nonprofit is required to report information about all of their expenses in one location. So this can be done in a couple different ways. It can be included in the face of the statement of activities. Um, it can be included as a separate schedule in the notes to the financial statements or it can be a separate financial statement, which is frequently referred to as the schedule of um, functional expenses or the statement of functional expenses. And I'll kind of show you an example of all three of those. Uh, it is not appropriate, however, to include that information as a supplemental schedule. It does need to be included uh, within the basic financial statements or footnotes. So what is the purpose of this? This is really to kind of help your donors, creditors and others in assessing your, your service, your mission, and how you are spending those dollars for each of those services. So it really gives you the opportunity to tell, tell your story. So we wanna make sure you are not underestimating the importance of preparing it correctly. So first screen here, this is the presentation where the information is included directly within the statement of activities. You can see it's broken down into two categories. You've got grant activities, which would be your program services, and then there's management in general um, with the detail included below. This is probably most common if you've got a, a smaller, non, less non-complex organization where it's not too much to include all of that directly on the face of the statement of activities. Alternatively, for some of the larger nonprofits or if you have multiple programs, um, this is a good, a good way to present that information this is an example where you would include maybe this table within your footnotes, or this could be your actual um, statement of functional expenses as well. So you can see um, down across the left side, we've got all of the, the nature of those expenses. And then across the top, we've got the function. So we've got program services. In this example, they have two programs. They've got advisory and training. We've got management in general, and then we've got fundraising. And we're going to talk about, uh, we'll jump back to this slide in a minute to kind of talk about a couple of things. So program expenses. These are the costs directly associated um, by the organization to, to perform your mission. Um, fundraising would be those expenses for activities undertaken to, you know, either induce potential donors to contribute money, to contribute their services, or maybe they're contributing other assets. Management in general, sometimes referred to as general and administrative. Those are those management and administrative costs which are incurred by your organization just for the overall operation of the nonprofit. And then some of our um, organizations might have member development activities. So if you're an association or some sort of membership um, type organization, you may also have member development cost for soliciting those prospective members um, related costs related to dues, member relations, et cetera. So those are kind of the main functional categories. When we look at um, ex 
allocation of those expenses by nature and function, there are some different ways that you may be allocating those expenses because your expense may not just be attributable to one function. Um, it may be program and management, it may be multiple programs. So how, how can those amounts be allocated? The first method is a direct allocation. So you're specifically identifying the expense and allocating it to that respective program. An example might be you look at your invoice and you can say, oh, this was all for our advisory program. And so that invoice is going to be allocated directly to the advisory program. Another uh, allocation basis is based on salaries. Uh, this is very common that I see in a number of the organizations that I work with. They are using those employee timesheets to allocate expenses based on how their employees are spending their time. So if employees are spending 50% of their time on program A, 25% on program B, and maybe 25% of management in general, that's how those underlying costs will be allocated out using those percentages. Square footage is also a pretty common one that we see used. You may look at your office space or your building to say, okay, how much of our space is, is being used by programs? And you will use that to allocate out that percentage of, for instance, maybe depreciation, maybe rent. Um, that would be a good, good examples of expenses that could be allocated out using square footage. There are, you can use any other rational and systematic basis. Um, for example, IT costs, you maybe would be allocating those out based on the number of computers. Um, so there's no, no um, hard and fast rule in what you need to be using for basis as long as you're systematic and that it uh, makes sense, is justifiable. So uh, Beth had mentioned our next session is on footnotes to the financial statements. Well, this is kind of a footnote type item. We just want to point it out here um, based on however you are doing your allocation of those expenses. You want to make sure that you are including information in your policy note, what, both what types of expenses are being allocated and then the basis over which they are being allocated. So this is a sample. It's just an example. Um, in this particular organization, they're allocating out personnel, facility, professional, legal, for example, and they are allocating those based on estimates of time and effort. All right, so we have our next polling question. And while you are answering that question, uh, maybe I can address one of the questions that are included in our uh, Q&A. Um, someone asked the question about what a split interest agreement is, with whom would that split interest be, um, or with whom would that be split? So that can take on a number of different forms. A lot of times it's donors. Um, they may be leaving money through this trust to a number of nonprofit organizations. So maybe you're just receiving a portion of it, 25% maybe. Um, also, it can be where um, there's, there's lots of different forms of split interest agreements where maybe the earnings on the split interest are coming to the nonprofit uh, over the period of the trust with the corpus or the original gift going either to another entity at the end or maybe to the donor itself. So there's a number of different types of, of split interest agreements we don't have time to go through today, but that would be an example of what a split interest would be. Some of the terminology you might hear is charitable remainder unitrust or charitable gift annuity. So if you've heard those kind of poking around, that's what we're talking about. Sure. All right, so everyone, our, this is our second polling question. If you are here for CPE, please make sure you are answering these polling questions. Make sure your slides box is maximized. You'll make your selection right on the screen and then make sure you hit submit right after answering your questions so the questions count and we'll keep this up for just a few more moments and then we'll continue i'm sorry about that stacy do you want to take your next question <laughs> you are fine i was just going to read the the polling question so the question was you know when was the last time your organization re-evaluated your allocation you know sometimes um, an organization will go through that initial allocation determine how things should be broken out or allocated across but never really going back and saying, okay, does this still make sense um, two, three, you know, five years later, 10 years later. So just a question asking you how often um, or when was the last time you evaluated that? And we are ready for the results. All right. So great. I'm glad, happy to see this, uh, that a number of you are responding that you have reevaluated it within the last year, 52%. So that's amazing. As auditors, we like to see that. 
All right, so common errors that we see in regards to the statement of functional expenses. Um, some of those would be, oops, excuse me, um, missing expenses that were netted on the statement of activities. So as I mentioned a little bit ago, we were gonna jump back to that statement. So Beth talked a little bit about those costs of direct benefits, that those can be netted against your special events of cost on the statement of activities. They are still expenses to the organization, so we want them to be included in our, our statement of functional expenses or our summary. But we also want to reconcile back to what are the expenses that are included on the um, in the expenses section of the statement of activities. So an example of how that can be presented is a separate column here for cost of direct benefits to donors um, with a line item, and then it does get backed out so that we can come down to what were the expenses in the expense section on the statement of activities. So very similar with um, cost of goods sold. For instance, if you have a gift shop, um, that is an example of, of how that can be um, presented as well. All right, I'll get back to my slide here. Too far. Another common error that we see is including losses or other equity transactions as part of expenses. So as we kind of talked about gains or losses, those are not expenses. Um, you would not include those in your statement of functional expenses. Those would be a separate, uh, in the separate, separate section there. Inadequate allocation, allocation method disclosures, um, making sure that how you are allocating them is appropriate for the type of expense that you have. Improper natural expense classifications. So there's no requirement on the number of or the level of detail of those natural expense classifications that you use. Sometimes we'll have organizations that will have a, a large number, maybe 15 different line items or more. Um, you really wanna step back and take a look at uh, what's important to the readers of your financial statements. This again, does give you the opportunity to kind of tell your story to make sure you're providing enough detail without going kind of overboard. So in some cases, less can be more. So. Um, take that into consideration as you are determining what level of detail, um, what level of disaggregation you're going to include in the statement of functional expenses. Another item that we typically see is the breakdown of the programs on the statement of activities may not agree with the breakdown of the programs on the statement of functional expenses. So if you've got two, two programs or two different level of uh, program revenues that are showing up in your statement of activities, you want to make sure that that is reflected in your statement of, of functional expenses as well, and that you were including all the, the appropriate breakdown by um, function within that statement. Okay, other common errors relating to functional expenses, occupancy and facility costs being presented as a separate program. So those are not a program of the entity. Those really should be allocated out across the programs and across management in general and fundraising as applicable. We might see errors agreeing to other statements or disclosures. Um, an example here, maybe in your statement of functional expenses, you've got a line item for your rent expense, making sure that that rent expense or the total rent expense agrees back to your disclosure um, in your lease footnote as to total rent expense. Uh, expenses that should be in management in general classification that are not. So 2016-14, um, which is kind of that nonprofit standard several years ago, really provided a lot more guidance as far as what shouldn't shouldn't be included in management in general. There was lots of disparity in practice in what organizations were including, and so that provided a little more guidance into what you should or shouldn't be using. Um, for example, accounting, payroll, HR, IT type thing, or not IT, not necessarily always IT, but those are examples of things that typically would be included in management in general and should not be included in program expenses. Uh, expenses not being allocated among categories, but should be. So for example, if you've got depreciation, uh, very likely the, the whole organization is benefiting from those assets. So we would typically expect to see depreciation being allocated between program management in general and fundraising. Certainly there are exceptions, um, but for the most part, making sure you are taking that into consideration that if, if an expense is benefiting more than one function, it is being allocated out. Including investment expenses instead of netting them with the investment return. So this is one example where netting is 
is appropriate in the statement of activities, you are going to net those inv investment expenses with your realized, unrealized gains and losses and report them as investment return. As a result, those amounts should not be included in your statement of functional expenses. Um, fundraising by nonprofits is not considered advertising. Uh, another thing is relating to fundraising, consider if, if those fundraising type costs are benefiting more than just fundraising. If you have those joint costs that are meeting the, the purpose, the audience criteria condition, um, that those are being allocated out among the various programs. A few best practices as it relates to statement of functional expenses, um, payroll and related costs. One second here. Um, for most, most nonprofits, payroll and related costs are a significant part of your total expenses. So if your nonprofit's approach involves allocating those expenses based on time and effort, you wanna make sure that you're training your staff on the importance of uh, diligent timekeeping. So make sure those timesheets for which they are being used to allocate are correct. You wanna verify consistent application of those allocation, allocation methodologies. And again, update them regularly for any changes in your cost structure, or maybe you have a triggering event such as you have office space that you've given up, or maybe you've taken on additional office space. Um, maybe you've had a new significant new program that was started, or if you've discontinued a program. These are all examples of triggering events that should make you step back and think, okay, how is this affecting my statement of functional expenses and how do I need to change my, my allocation methodology? It's good to take a analytical review of those functional classifications and compare them to the prior year. Um, this can help you identify if you may have your errors. Um, and if you have significant variances, maybe make sure that you are able to explain to your auditors why there is a variance this year. This is the thing that triggered there to be more program service revenues, for example. Remember that your financial statements tell a story about your organization and the use of your resources to accomplish your mission. So consider uh, the readers of your financial statements and what information would be beneficial to them. If, if your functional expense methodologies are in need of an overhaul, don't hesitate to reach out to your external auditors. Um, most are familiar with those industry practices and can help provide recommendations to you to help understand various options available. All right, with that, we are gonna jump into the statement of cash flows. Um, there's a number of information here. We'll kind of go through some of it a little fast, but just wanting to make sure you have it available to you. As a reminder, there's two different methods of statement of cash flows. There's the direct and the indirect method. The direct method is where you're starting with um, your cash flows from operating activities and listing those out individually. The indirect method, you're starting with your change in net assets to reconcile back to your change in operating cash flows. So with that, um, you are required to present the change in cash, cash equivalents, restricted cash, and restricted cash equivalents. So as Beth mentioned earlier, you may have some of those restricted cash for either long-term or um, capital campaign type purposes. GAP does not define restricted cash. Um, you would have the ability to define what you your organization is considering to be restricted cash in your policy footnote. And you want to make sure that you're showing a reconciliation between the amounts included in the statement of financial position and the statement of cash flow, um, what's all being included in your uh, cash and cash equivalents and restricted cash. That can be done within the statement of cash flows or it can be um, included in the notes to the financial statements. Leases are fun, our favorite new standard this year. There's lots of um, disclosures or different effects to the cash flows both operating, financing, and investing. So the slide lists those out. Your principal payments from finance leases are gonna be considered a financing cash flow. Payments on operating leases to bring that right of use asset to necessary condition would be considered an investing cash flow. Ongoing payments on operating leases and variable and short-term lease payments not included are both operating cash flows. And any interest that you have on finance leases is gonna follow those um, codification 230 statement of cash flows, where you are required to report um, the amounts of cash paid for um, interest. All right, um, some typical issues that we see with state, statement of cash flows, uh, the signs of those 
amounts that are included, making sure the positive versus negative, you have them going the correct way. Commonly, we'll see captions that don't agree to the corresponding captions in the statement of financial position, statement of activities, or functional expenses. So for a good example here is maybe on the statement of financial position, you've got it listed as um, accrued, accrued accruals and other expenses. Make sure then your um, statement of cash flows has the same caption. It doesn't, it doesn't just say accruals. So you want to make sure your captions are agreeing throughout the financial statements to each other. Similarly, you want to make sure your amounts agree to the corresponding amounts within those other statements. If you have um, depreciation expense that's being disclosed in or a separate line item in your statement of functional expenses, make sure the dollar amount of that depreciation expense agrees to the dollar amount of depreciation expense in your statement of cash flows. So make sure you don't have any rounding errors um, and everything balances out. Cash received and paid in agency transactions would be considered cash flows from operating activities and that can be presented at either gross or net. Um, some issues we see is failing to properly report those adjustments. So bad debt expense. Um, this is an item that should be reported separately in your statement of cash flow. Um, it should not be included in your change in accounts receivable, but it should be listed out as a separate line item. Gains and losses similarly um, would be included <coughs> um, as a separate line item. Those gains and losses are going to be an adjustment to your operating cash flows. And then alternatively, any proceeds from the sale would be included in the investing section. Split interest agreements, which we talked about a little bit, depending on the type of the nature of the transaction, um, the contribution portions of a new split interest agreement are going to be adjustments to the operating section, as well as that change in value of split interest, split interest obligations. So it's both if you are um, the there's different rules if you are holding the split interest agreement or if you are just a beneficiary of the split interest agreement. So making sure you have them broken out in the proper, proper sections. Contributions for long-term investments or fixed assets need to be included in the adjustment section and in the financing section. So amounts recognized in the statement of activities, those actual contributions, those are gonna be adjustments to arrive at operating cash flows. Alternatively, the cash received or collected for those long-term um, investment or fixed assets is going to be shown as financing inflows. So those amounts may not match up within your statement of cash flows if you have contributions receivable, um, as the cash portion should only be, the cash portion reflected in financing flows is only for the cash collected. So you may have received a contribution and collected it in the same year, um, or you may be collecting uh, payments from a prior year uh, promise to give. So. The difference within that will be uh, disclosed within the change in contributions receivable adjustment line item. Amounts designated by the governing board for long-term purposes are operating activities. So those would not be considered financing because they are board designated and the board can either um, remove that designation if needed. Investing activities. So purchases of fixed assets um, that may be on a cruel basis need to be presented at the actual cash out flow. So if you have items that you've purchased, fixed assets that are still sitting in accounts payable at year end, you should only be reporting the purchase for the cash portion. Um, the impact of the other side of that would be in your adjustment line item or your change in accounts payable uh, within the operating section. Netting purchases, abandonments, or sales of fixed assets with purchases is another issue we see. You wanna make sure that those proceeds are being reflected um, in the long, um, in the investing section for any of those long lived assets. Purchases and sales of investments, those are not allowed to be netted. They need to be shown gross within the statement of activities. Uh, financing, so proceeds from the issuance of debt should be presented separately from payments on debt. Um, they should be presented gross, not net. Similarly, with your lines of credit, those should also be presented at gross versus net. The exception there would be if that line of credit is due in three months or less, you are able to net those amounts. Debt issuance costs are a, are a financing cash outflow, um, not an adjustment to reconcile to the change in net assets. So those making sure the, the initial costs are included as an adjustment. 
Um, some other financing activities, reporting reclassification of a liability from current to non-current, we typically see errors there. When you have a refinancing of debt, uh, you need to look at what is the flow of the cash. If, if that cash actually flowed through your organization, you received the new debt proceeds and paid off the old debt, then you would show that as a financing cash inflow and outflow. However, if the bank or if the cash never went through your organization, if it went from one lender to the other, then you likely have a non-cash transaction to be disclosed. Some other issues that we typically see with financing activities, um, omitting those cash contributions, as we mentioned, from the long-term investments or fixed assets. So that cash collections for endowment or for capital campaigns, um, those are going to be included in the financing activities. Um, under the indirect method, you're gonna direct deduct those from operating and include in the financing ex activities section. And as we mentioned, if you have contributions receivable, those amounts may not agree from year to year, um, and that change will flow through uh, the adjustment or that change in account and contributions receivable as part of the operating section. Another common error that we see is failing to report payments received. Um, oh, that we already talked about as far as kind of the, uh, the same thing there, those long lived assets and as finan financing inflows. Some other um, errors relating specifically to other more unique situations, uh, the split interest agreement gifts. If you have a gift in the current year, making sure that is reported as a cash inflow uh, for financing for that cash transferred. If you have annuity payments, you wanna make sure that you're reporting those annuity payments as a financing cash outflow. Non-cash investing in financing activities. So we typically see um, the failure to disclose information about non-cash gifts restricted for long-term purposes. Maybe you receive a donation of a stock donation, for example, that would be a non-cash gift and making sure that is properly um, reflected failing to adjust and disclose purchases of fixed assets that might still be in accounts payable. As we mentioned, uh, the purchases should be, should be shown only at the cash portion. You would still, while you don't include them in your statement of functional, uh, statement of cash flows, you still wanna disclose what those non-cash items are. Omitting disclosure relating to those lease liabilities resulting from obtaining the right of use assets. Those would be other examples of non-cash transactions and failing to disclose debt incurred for acquiring assets. So similar to the accounts payable, um, you may have purchased assets during the year that were financed with debt. Um, that would also be a non-cash item that should be um, disclosed as well. Supplemental statement of cash flows. Um, you have a requirement to disclose the cash paid for income, tax paces, uh, income taxes paid and interest paid. So you want to make sure when you are looking at interest, you're considering any accruals for interest. You want to make sure you're only reporting the actual cash outflow um, that was actually paid out for your interest. You also need to consider if you had any capitalized interest in, included in there as well. So some of those disclosures relating to statement of functional cash flows. So with that, we just want to do a quick final review. There will be one more polling question here coming. Um, as you are putting together your statements, take a look at whether you've got them classified, are descriptions appropriate, um, any new items that need to be included or excluded, are there things that you know should have changed based on the set of circumstances that happened during the year, and also looking at formatting, spacing, and alignment. Uh, we have a slide here which has got some resources available for you. Um, the accounting standards codification has several sections. The AICPA's uh, non-for-profit section has a Save Our Charities example financial statements, which is great. It gives you an example, a visual of how some of these things would be presented. Um, and there's other information there on the slide. We, we have running out of time, so I won't go through each of those, but you have those in your slide deck. So with that, we have our last polling question. Will you be joining us for part two of our webinar series? Um, we've got the date there on October 18th. More information about the disclosures. And as mentioned, we will um, take all of the questions if we didn't get them answered today, we will reach out separately um, to answer your questions since we ran out of time today.
Okay, There's everyone, the last clean question <laughs> is up right now. If you are here for CPE, you will be answering your, this last polling question, and then you will be able to download your certificate right from the certification box. You will just click View Certificate, and then you will have the option to download your certificate. And if for any reason you have any issues with your certificate, you will be receiving a thank you email. And at that time, you can respond back to that thank you email and we'll be able to take care of it on the back end. All righty. And then we do have one last fourth extra polling question if you need it. Um, and with that, if everyone has downloaded their certificate. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you to our presenters who gave a awesome webinar. And again, we hope to see you on part two that's gonna be coming up soon. And I will give you back the rest of your day. Thank you everyone for joining us today and have a great rest of your week and weekend. Bye everyone.